now it is the turn of uh, uh, Professor Emanuele Paolini, he is a full professor in economic sociology, sociology and social policy at the University of Macerata. Please, is your turn, Emanuele Paolini. Thanks, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, the presentation is going to be, uh, you'll see it in, in a short while, it doesn't relate uh, to the COVID pandemic, but of course some of the mechanisms we are discussing on how to link household characteristics, behaviors, and potentially schools, uh, behaviors and choices, and inequality, and education inequality can become even stronger uh, when we consider what's happening right now. So in this respect, what Professor Boeri just told us fits uh, really well as a problem uh, along with what I'm going to uh, describe and discuss with you. Um, I'll share my presentation, I hope, you can see it. Um, I have to do it. I hope uh, you can see it, or is it too small? We do, we do. We do, okay. but it's small. Okay. Let's say I'm trying just to figure out if I can do it uh, differently and show it. Uh, sorry. Um, let's do it like this, so even if it's a bit not as nice, but at least I think you can see it better. So um, the title is misleading in the sense that the title is, is, is framed in a positive way. So how the education system can might limit social inequalities in relation to education inequalities, whereas the paper is really about what schools uh, should not do in order to foster uh, social uh, education inequalities. Um, our starting point, sorry, there are problems. So uh, the basic point is, uh, I mean, it's what I'm gonna present is comes out from a contribution we just published with a colleague of mine, Argent, Angeluca Argentine. Um, on how schools directly contribute to the reproduction of social inequalities. This could have been a better title for my presentation, but it was too pessimistic in a way. Um, the point is thanks to institutions like Imbalsi in Italy, or we've heard about other institutions during these two days of the conference, um, we finally have the chance to study micro mechanisms about social inequalities related to education to an extent which we are not able to do until a few years ago, at least at least uh, for the Italian case. So really what we can start doing with large quantitative data sets, uh, large data sets and therefore quantitative analysis is to focus on how schools directly contribute to the, or do not contribute to the reproduction of, of social inequalities. So what is the starting point? Is it kind of a, an interesting puzzle? Uh, in the last century, if you want, in the last 70 years after the Second World War, we saw a massive increase of school participation rates, uh, at least in industrialized countries, uh, an increasing number of hours and years spent at school for young generations, a large amount of public investment in education. Unfortunately, it's slightly less to use a euphemism in the Italian case to pair, compare to other countries. But even if we got all this good news, which is, which are of course good news, uh, we see uh, substantially a persistent uh, social inequality in education phenomenon. Um, in, in many countries and in particular in Italy, um, either if you measure it in terms of students' performances, school performances, or the type of education level, educational level attained. Um, so I'm talking as a sociologist or an economic sociologist, uh, usually uh, in, in economic sociology and sociology more in general, when you refer to uh, the effects of students' social backgrounds, um, you reflect to what are called primary and secondary effects. I'll show them um, in, in, a, in the next two slides. So usually here the focus is to understand how much uh, students' social background, uh, in particular their, their families, 
um, play an important role in explaining what happens in terms of educational opportunities, uh, class-based inequality, and the reproduction over time. Now, most of the literature uh, in the last 30 years, 40 years, uh, quantitative research on this topic among sociologists focused on two types of effects, what are called primary and mostly secondary effects. Um, in the last five to 10 years, there is an increasing literature looking at what, uh, what they are called in the literature tertiary effects. What do we mean by these concepts? Primary effects, um, inequality in education achievements, okay? So these are the effects linked to those characteristics of student social background that have a direct influence on their education performance. So home environment, health and nutrition, economic, cultural and social resources. Oh, by the way, if we refer to COVID, uh, I don't know how many of you were, were here this morning on, on the conference this morning when we heard the Hofstede uh, presentation uh, from the Hofstede colleague presentation. Well, one shocking, if you want, one shocking result of the COVID is that it reminds us that there is a part of the Italian uh, youth population which gets its most important um, nutrition uh, meal uh, at school. So the fact that we had a lockdown uh, did not just have an impact on education, but it had also a direct impact on health. And again, that was one of the points Tito Boeri raised uh, in one of his slides. Uh, so anyway, uh, those who study primary effects look at how directly uh, the, the family and the households uh, students belong to the home environment as an impact on their education achievements. So how good they fare at school. Um, this concept though is quite related to another uh, concept used in sociology since the 70s, which is cultural capital, the way Bourdieu defined it, which is slightly different than what we would define in economic in social economic terms nowadays, um, human capital. He refers, as you say, as you see here, uh, to the idea that students from more educated or highly educated families tend to incorporate uh, cultural resources and display them in the interaction with teachers, and that gives them, in a way or another, a, a reward. So primary effects uh, are important. Secondary effects are the main thing that has been studied for a long time in, in, in social stratification, um, sociological studies. Uh, secondary effects refers to uh, inequality in education choices uh, at turning points in, career, in the career, in the education career. So transition from secondary to tertiary education or where you have a, a track system as the, Ita the Italian one, um, what type of upper secondary school you choose and how much uh, your social and, and, and education and, and family backgrounds influences uh, the type of choice you make. Um, again, being careful and taking into account differences in students' achievements, okay? So secondary effects are stronger when you see that two students with a similar student's achievement level choose different uh, career paths, educational career paths. Uh, in terms of going or not going to a university, choosing a certain type of school, a lyceum, instead of a, a professional um, school and so on, uh, or a VET program, depending mostly not on their achievement, but on their family background, social background. Um, then we've got tertiary effects. Uh, this is the... the, the, the the definition you would find in the recent literature that has studied the phenomenon. Um, as I will show you later on, um, we used a, a kind of a broader definition of tertiary effects, but what ESSA, for instance, uses is uh, this idea of variation in teachers' attitudes and behaviors, quote, 
in the institutional sorting process through their expectations, evaluations, and recommendations toward pupils and students with different social backgrounds. So the idea is Teachers' attitudes and behaviors are shaped by students' social background, uh, might be shaped, sorry, by students' social background, and they might provide feedbacks and they might behave differently depending on the students' backgrounds. So in, the, in this kind of a definition, um, teachers play a, a role, a potential direct role in fostering inequality in education attainment. Now, what has done empirical sociology mostly so far? But again, if you look at this conference uh, in the in single stream sessions, you'll see there are several papers that study what we call tertiary effects, okay? But mostly until recently, until a few years ago, empirical sociology on education and quality, adopting a quantitative approach, um, used mostly to focus on secondary effects. Why? Well, two reasons. First, uh, previous research was not too focusing on tertiary effects, and uh, some of the researchers find, uh, found out that secondary effects are usually more important than primary effects, in terms of explaining variation, at least. And the main other point is that primary and tertiary effects were not too much studied because we did not have enough available data to, task, to test hypothesis or functioning of this type of effects. So data limitation, data availability limitation uh, was uh, a big problem in order to study primary and especially tertiary effects um, in school and in, in education inequality. What do we do in, the, in, a, in our research with Gianluca and other colleagues? Well, we we take the SR definition of tertiary effects, uh, but we broaden up the definition. Uh, so when we talk about tertiary effects, we more in general refer to all mechanisms reproducing inequalities of opportunity within the school system. So it's not about just teachers. We are very interested to look at how head school, I mean, school uh, masters, uh, principals, however you want to define them, um, can strategically behave to try to reduce inequalities or with their actions, increasing the chance of reproducing uh, education inequalities. And the other point is when we look at teachers, we don't just look at uh, attitudes and I mean, their attitudes and behaviors towards students, but also a, a broader mechanisms of allocation of teachers quality to students uh, being fair or unfair, depending on their social background. So being an um, economic sociologist with Gianluca, we also look at teachers as a labor market, okay? So teachers moving between schools and within schools as, a, as an allocation uh, phenomenon which can have an impact on, 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 on inequality, on, on education inequality. Um, the scheme I show you here practically tries to synthesize what I'm telling, what I've been telling you. So you've got students' social origins on the upper left part of the of the of the scheme. Uh, primary effects are those, uh, as I told you before, is how directly families and with its own resources um, and and home environment influences uh, students' educational performance. Uh, secondary effects are more related to how families then support students' education in terms of levels, type of education, choices. You go to university or not, you choose a certain path in high school or not, and so on. We could add you go to a private or a public school or not. In other countries, not too much in Italy. Tertiary effects, as you can see, they are focusing on both points, but they are on the right of this scheme. They got in our opinion, both uh, an impact on students' education performance, but also on students' and families' choices on uh, where to stop studying, if to continue, where if to if they want to keep on studying, what type of school they choose, and so on. And then there's these are the three effects or mechanisms, macro mechanisms through which you look, look at what is going to be the social class destination of the students compared to the, 
to the to the to the origin. I mean, to the, the parents' uh, social class. Now, um, as we were saying before, uh, large-scale microdata on students' achievement and school performances are making us very happy as researchers because we can study a lot more primary effects than what we did in the past, and especially we can study a lot more tertiary effects. So we can study more the specific and direct role of schools, um, teachers, and, and, and principals, and we, in the interaction with families, students' families, in, in, in creating, recreating, or not recreating um, uh, school and educational inequalities. So there is a big uh, chance in front of us uh, to, to improve our knowledge. I'll show you some of the results of the, the analysis um, we've done in general terms, but of course, um, I'll be more than happy to, to show you more detailed results on, on some of the points that we raised just shortly now. Um, sorry. Uh, in, in our research with Gianluca, what we did is that we focus on micro mechanisms. I mean, this is something be, which has become increasingly common in part of sociological analysis as an economic analysis. Um, you look at macro relationship between social class, uh, education outcomes, and so on, but you want to know more how exactly the link works between macro phenomena. Okay, so we started focusing on three on the role of three types of um, mechanisms, uh, a set of mechanisms. Again, we do not pretend this. What I'm going to show you in the next slides is a is a complete and 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 uh, satisfactory list of all these micro mechanisms, but it's a way to start discussing them and, and look at them and have an idea. So let's look at macro mechanisms in relation to the role of families. There are several. Um, here we can show you uh, four of them, which might have an influence on attainments, um, on, on students' attainments and performances. Um, let's start from expectations. I mean, this is probably the most known one uh, in general. Um, usually we know that parental expectations of their pupils is higher on middle and upper class parents in terms of education outcomes uh, in order to avoid downward social mobility. There's just, a, I've seen it today, there is just a new article from Carlo Barone and colleagues that came out on, on this specific topic and how this mechanisms works in terms of like rational choice um, approaches. So there is, more explicit pressure and expectations from parents on middle and upper class students and children on education outcomes. And we can start to study that even more with data. Um, what we did with Gianluca, and there are also a couple of OECD papers on this, which is, is very interesting, is the direct parental education support is the second point. We start to have also in the OECD PISA, uh, um, survey of 2012, for instance, they've asked if students were supported in their homeworks by parents. So with Gianluca Argentine, we started to do research on this topic and what you find out, especially in countries like Italy, there is a strong social class effect. Um, the social class of the students, I mean, the parents of the students, tell you a lot about the probability that students will be supported at home by their parents or close relatives in homeworks. Now, if you think about this point with, with COVID, you can understand the nightmare we are facing right now, and that goes directly to what uh, Tito Boeri was saying before. Not just, uh, it was kind of very problematic for students to study during the lockdown in Italy, in the last, practically the last year, uh, but also the kind of online teaching requires students to be more motivated and to be more supported by their households. So if you live in a country where in normal times, 
uh, middle and upper classes parents tend already to help more their children than other, uh, other classes. You can imagine, and that's something we hope we'll see and we will be able to study better in the future, that these mechanisms of parents supporting at home for homework uh, and motivation uh, their children has dramatically increased even during the pandemic, making it even more, uh, again, dramatic, the distance between those students who can count on uh, emotional um, and knowledge support from parents to those who cannot. Um, third interesting point um, is not, I mean, Invalsi does not have this type of data, but we increasingly have uh, time use survey data um, and other similar uh, information where we can look at how parents from different social classes spend their time, their free time with their children, what they do. And again, here it's quite clearly that even if it's not directly related to, uh, I mean, to obtain good education results, middle and upper classes spend a lot more of their free time with their children doing cultural or social cultural activities which are directly supporting potentially their, uh, their performance at school, to bring them to museums, you bring them to, to national history, I mean, natural history museums, you bring them to archaeological sites, you help them to deliver a taste for, for classical music and so on. You read them books, you read together with them books since they are kids and so on. So in general, uh, middle and upper classes, parents invest a lot more time, free time, not just in kind of a free relaxing leisure activities such as watching a football game, but in cultural activities. But again, uh, Italy is particularly striking in this respect. Fourth, uh, and this goes directly in the interaction between uh, parents, uh, schools, and teachers. On average, what we see from several researches is that more uh, educated parents tend to participate more in schools' activities. Uh, they are more often active in, in, in uh, parents' associations within schools, they tend more often to be the representatives of parents in, in boards with teachers. So on one hand, they are more active in school life. On the other hand, quite often they tend to control more strictly teacher quality. They tend to question more uh, teachers about uh, how they work in terms of placing pressure on on higher performance from the school for their children. So there are several mechanisms through which families, and this is primary, mostly primary effects, okay? Then let's move to schools as organizations. Again, other mechanisms that can explain, strengthen, or again, if we do something about, they could uh, reduce uh, um, education inequalities. Well, Again, I was in a session this, I was chairing a session this morning and, and we heard a, a paper on this topic, uh, but there is, uh, there, are, there is several research. Part of this research has been also done by Patrizia, uh, myself and many others. Uh, in Italy, again, but it's not just an Italian case, it's extremely strong in Italy, but we are not alone. Again, look at what we heard this morning on the, on the presentation on England. Uh, there are often very strong territorial divides in terms of how school works and in terms of how they are able to support and help students grow. Uh, there are no, I mean, in Italy is first of all, and, and may, not just mainly, first of all, is a north, northern Italy, southern Italy divide. But again, the presentation we heard this morning as previous studies done on Invalsi data show that there is a lot of differentiation and heterogeneity even within macro regions. So there is not one South, there are several Souths in this respect and the same applies for the center part of the country and the North. Um, then what we start to see is something until 20 years ago, we would have thought it was more typical of Anglo-Saxon environments. 
we start to see segregation between schools. Uh, we start to see uh, student uh, white flight, we could call it. Okay, so um, you start to see using, for instance, in Valsi data with geo, geo referenciation, that uh, it's higher the likelihood of middle and upper class, especially upper class students, to move to a school they think is better than, than the closest one they have. Um, at the local level, we're talking about pub public schools, but not necessarily just them. Um, and sometimes better is not about quality of education, however you wanna try to measure it. It's about uh, social class homogeneity and social homogeneity that certain schools tend to provide more than others. Which brings us to the second point you see when we talk about segregation between schools, is not just about strategies from parents and eventually students if they realize what's going on. Sometimes and increasingly there are schools who try to attract, uh, or better said, select uh, better performing students. So there is an increasing uh, amount of empirical findings that show that part of the school systems try to send messages and whenever it's possible and they got a freedom for it to attract a certain type of students instead of others. We look at social class, but of course, um, ethnic back background uh, works potentially quite well in, in relation to this topic. Uh, in the Italian system, especially when you look at primary school and lower secondary, we should be kind of a universal school, so everybody just goes to a class no matter what. What we found with the data, and again, this is also thanks to Ivalsi, because Ivalsi developed some indicators to measure it. Um, we also find a phenomena of within school segregation. So the allocation and sorting of students among different classes, uh, depending on their social background, or if you're lucky, uh, not on the social background, but their previous uh, school performance, which by the way, we know of course that a good part is related to social background. So either they do it directly on the base of social backgrounds or indirectly on the base of uh, students' performances. Valsi has shown us that many schools, not all of them, again, we are not talking about here mechanisms that take place to the same extent everywhere, okay? This is a variable, it's not a constant. And that's why it's important to discuss about it and then discuss how we could do something about it. Teachers' mobility across schools. Again, this matches, if you want, the segregation between schools mechanisms. Um, principals, principals to different extents uh, are willing to attract or retain certain types of teachers which are considered good for a, a given school and, and vice versa. So you might have sort of a self-selection uh, mechanisms on both sides from teachers and principals. So ambitious teachers and ambitious in terms of uh, having also a, a strong social recognition and want to have good performing students might be attracted to certain schools instead of others in terms of, for instance, where they, where they are located in terms of social uh, and economic environment. <laughs> and principals can do the same. Um, this uh, teacher's mobility across schools can be matched by what happens within schools and so the assignment of teachers and students, but especially teachers, to particular classes. Again, you can have a within school segregation on the, on the side of students. You can have a kind of a um, not homogeneous and not normal uh, distribution of, of teachers, of, of teachers' assignments between classes, sending the best teachers or at least what could be considered the best teacher in a given environment to the most uh, performing class or where there is a higher probability of having uh, uh, students with, from, a, from a medium to high uh, family background. Directly, the role of teachers. This is really uh, uh, what um, tertiary effect um, 
I mean, this would be the not our definition, as I told you, our definition is broader. It includes this one, but it's not just this one. This would be the, the original definition of tertiary effects. So what uh, Gianluca and, and others have found, for instance, using invalid data, is that there is often, again, it's a variable, uh, it's not a constant, but there is often a teacher's bias in assigning marks to students. Here is interesting because you can match the mark the school gives to students and you compare it to the invalid test results. And what it comes out is that often, depending on the social class, depending on other characteristics of the student's social background, two students uh, with similar invalid test results get different marks depending on their social class. So if you come from an upper class or a medium upper class, you tend to have controlling for your performance on the, on the, on the Valsi test, a better mark, a higher mark, uh, which of course, as we know in the, in the, in the more uh, psychological literature on this phenomena, it, has a, it can have a, a, a reinforcing effect. Uh, it becomes a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, if you tell a student he's not too good, uh, because it doesn't come from a middle and upper class, uh, you might start thinking, or she might start thinking, she's not too good, and vice versa. The same, again, has been studied to teachers' recommendations on what type of upper secondary school tracking, uh, upper secondary school uh, they should choose. And again, what we find using, again, invalid results is students with similar invalid results tend to have often different advices uh, and teachers' recommendations on what type of high school to go through, to go to, not depending on their invalid test uh, results, but on their social, uh, social economic background. And lastly, there, is a, uh, there are studies trying to look at how interactions among teachers and students take place in classes and how Sometimes teachers can interact, uh, providing more encouraging and positive feedbacks to students depending on their social class. I realize I'm running out of time, so apologies. Uh, overall, so again, why am I saying these things about Italy? Well, because Italy uh, formally, at least until the end of lower secondary school, should have a very universal school system. Uh, we don't do early tracking as in Germany. We don't have a very strong private sector, private school sector, which could, again, uh, divide students on the base of public versus private. So you would expect that at least before high school, you shouldn't find too much inequality. But what we found so far, and it's just the beginning of this type of research uh, stream, is that if you go as, as we right here uh, beyond the surface, uh, you find a lot hidden mechanisms that are at work. So, conclusions. Um, we can use uh, this type of macro mechanisms uh, to start studying better what happens in school. There are many others which should study quantitative data, new quantitative data, new tests, standardized tests as the invalid ones allow us to do a lot more things than the past. For instance, as I said, compare um, students' marks, uh, which are given by teachers with, with, uh, with, with invalid tests. To do what? Of course, this is not just research. I mean, the idea is that, of course, it's good to do research on these topics if you're interested into social inequality or interested into education system. But the goal, of course, apart from that, is what we call public sociology, but you don't have to use the words. It's about trying to find ways to reduce the strength of these mechanisms, reinforcing um, the transmission of inequalities, uh, of educational inequalities from one generation to another. How to do that? Well, first, research is good. Second, discussing the results is good. Uh, I realize that in many times, not even teachers or some of the principals have a clear impact of what happens if you decide to, for instance, create, um, how to call it, yeah, segregation, uh, class segregation uh, strategies. 
Uh, the last point we start to see, and this is very interesting because this is a field of research where you find economists, psychologists, and sociologists all together usually, is starting to do some experimental studies. So once you understand some of these micromechanisms, it's interesting to do experiments in schools, trying to see how you can develop even sometimes small interventions which can try to reshape and reduce the, the negative impact of, of the micro mechanisms I've discussed so far. Um, apologies again for being slightly too long in my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Paolini, for your speech and for stressing how many aspects influence inequality in and out of school. Thank you very much. Now, Time for question. Uh, I don't see anything. Any question? Uh, I think uh, there are something about uh, Gustavo Lanata. Can you? Yes, please. Gustavo, Gustavo. Lanata. Lanata. Um, um, the information, of course, is very interesting, and thank you for that. Uh, I've worked and I've had the pleasure to work in many schools in different parts of the world. And um, Groner Bata, sorry, my dog wants to go out. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't pick the best time. Sorry, what's the name of your dog? Uh, Groner. Groner. Okay. Mine is Groner. Cleopatra, and she's right here with me as well. So okay. don't worry. <laughs> All right. No, but I, I guess the information, as strong as it is, have you come up with any suggestions or have you collected suggestions of how to change that? Because I worked in a lot of schools and what you're saying really hit home. And in fact, I was one of those kids, except that my parents were very educated. But my wife, for example, by the sixth year of school, and she went to what you guys call private, but what in England we know as public, um, to a school by the six, the sixth year, her parents couldn't help her with her homework. She had to go out and figure out all this stuff herself. So what can we do? Or at least what direction may we take? And thank you for fielding my question. Uh, thanks. Well, um, I can start providing, I mean, we need a long set of answers. So for instance, when I was uh, asking what uh, Professor Boeri thought about it, full-time school, uh, the American or uh, the British, the Anglo-Saxon way. So you go to school sometimes until three or four in the afternoon. And then the school organizes, that's the American way, uh, if you want, organizes also post-school recreational sport, uh, cultural activities. I think that is one of the way forwards. The Italian system relies too much on students doing homeworks and, and uh, starting by themselves, which was good as long as there was a, I mean, I mean, it's, it's very bad to say it like that, but the system worked as long as you had a lot of people dropping out of school when they, are, they were 14 or 15. But in a world where you really want to have students studying as much as possible and learning as much as possible, um, you need to have more time spent at school with professional support. Uh, perhaps uh, middle and upper classes children would not need it, but the others, yes. So one thing is we should in that term transform our high school and uh, whole school system in terms of how much time you spend at school uh, more toward an Anglo-Saxon model. Um, we should, and, and that, uh, that is, is not just about, just about time, it's also about how you teach and, and the fact that uh, in a way, uh, school in itself and interaction at school should help students to learn. Um, I would we use a word that is inappropriate in a way, but defamiliarizing the role families play in supporting them in their knowledge, which means that of course, parents are free to do whatever they want and help I mean, If somebody would tell me, stop helping your daughter to improve her human capital skills, I would tell the person you're crazy and shut up, this is my private life. 
this is not the point. The point is a, a good education system should not implicitly uh, think that students, in order to learn, they have also to rely on their parents and private resources. Uh, but going to more uh, micro, uh, other micro choices. Um, well, for instance, uh, I would change the way students are allocated within classes in Italy. With, 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 uh, with other colleagues, we are starting to see that there are several kind of formal informal mechanisms through which uh, class allocation takes place. For instance, when you shift from primary to lower secondary school. Middle and upper classes parents tend to push a lot more pressures on principals to get their kids stuck, sticking together in, in primary school, which then creates, without even perhaps wanting it, um, kind of a segregation mechanisms. Again, Patrizia, Roberto, and others have shown in many Italian schools, you find a high segregation within each school. And I think it wouldn't be too hard to create mechanisms of just chance, random allocation of students by their last name or whatever in schools um, and so on. But this is putting like restraints. I think one of the important thing, uh, it would be to, to show this kind of data a lot more to teachers because one thing I've learned doing uh, organization analysis, not related to school in general, is that if an organization fails in, in, in delivering a function, it's not necessarily because people are evil. There are automatic mechanisms, okay? So the, the shocking things I've seen in relation to some of the micro mechanisms we, we described in the paper is that teachers sometimes are not aware of the, of the, of the consequences in terms of inequality that certain types of behaviors that they take for granted can have. So just having the chance to discuss with teachers and principals, um, it can be an important first point in uh, yeah, informing and, and making teachers and, and professionals in school systems aware that there are uh, social consequences in terms of social inequality consequences of behaviors that apparently go in another direction. They are not related, but they do. Um, the, I mean, this would be some mechanisms, but then uh, there should be a lot more. So thanks a lot. Uh, sorry, I got some questions. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Monti, please. Yes, thank you for the presentation, first of all. And uh, since we're talking about somehow about parenting style, right, about how parents, well-educated parents tend to pressure more about on teacher quality and so on. This, this behavior by well-educated parents, do, do, do you study if it depends on the other characteristics of the area where they lay, for example, inequality or returns of education to education of the, for example, I'm thinking about the work by Zili Botti and the about parenting styles, and they, from their cross-country analysis, they, they see that where the inequality is low, parents tend to, to pressure less and to be more, more permissive. And also the same is where returns to education is, is, less, uh, is less high. <clears throat> so I was wondering if you, you studied this kind of relationship between well-educated parent behavior and, and uh, parenting style. So no. permissive versus... Uh, no, but uh, thanks. Uh, Giorgio, I think, is a, is a very good idea. Uh, one thing we found for Italy so far, which is interesting, but it doesn't go in the direction that you look at, that uh, we will have to look at, I mean, we, find, we found it that there is an increasing uh, trend going on, which is the role of mothers compared to the, in the last 20 years, Mothers are increasingly playing in the couple, I mean, among the parents, if there is a couple, this role of the kind of a watchdog of their edu children education, uh, which if you're Italian, you think is a typical stereotype. I'm not discussing the stereotype. I'm just saying that 
If you look at, for instance, several data, they show that increasingly are the mothers in charge of uh, supporting and, and making decisions uh, for, for their children in terms of day-to-day -day support in education, um, putting pressure, um, which is a, a phenomenon interesting in itself. But thanks again for, for the suggestion. It's going to be interesting to, to add uh, the type of analysis you propose. Thank you. Thank you. If I look at uh, Otavio's, um, yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out if you can study with Invalsi data. So I'm smiling looking at Patricia because she heard uh, Otavio's point uh, from my voice probably 10 times. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, what, what is, if, if I understand correctly, what Otavio's research is suggesting is that in primary school, practically that whole class is the same. It should be the same in lower secondary school, but in lower secondary school, you can have some choices. You can choose the second language. You can choose, depending on the school, between German or Spanish, um, first, uh, first introduction to Latin instead of French. Sorry? Musical instrumental. Musical instruments, um, advanced math class. So what I really like to do, and let's hope Impalsi will help me in that, is that really this type of specific classes are not, I mean, they got, a, a, again, talking as a sociologist, they got a, a manifest function. You know, I want my daughter to learn how to play violin, okay. But then I think they got also what is called, what Merton used to call a Latin function. Uh, take music, okay. In order to apply for music, it's, I mean, it's more likely that somebody applying for music is somebody coming from a family where they've learned to appreciate music and perhaps they've spent time playing an instrument. But that's highly related to social class. Or if you want to at least the, the cultural education level uh, of parents. So some of these uh, possibilities are, are in a way a mechanism through which middle and upper class parents can try to select the type of environment, class environment their children will have. You, are, you don't care if your daughter or son will play the violin. Perhaps they do it anyway outside school and, and they spend a lot more time and money on that. The important thing is that in the moment you send them to the music class, you're gonna have a higher likelihood. You're gonna find other peers in the same class, which have the same type of interest and the same type of parents' background. Mm -hmm. So the more you introduce in lower secondary schools, this kind of differentiation opportunities, which indirectly um, can self-select students. This might work. I mean, this is an hypothesis that I hope we will be able to test. This might be a way to, in a way or another, to create some sort of a, a intra-school uh, selection and segregation. Yes. There is another question about Giorgio Santi. Can you speak, please? Giorgio Santi? Okay, yes, good afternoon. I, I was wondering if the teacher bias you talked about in your slides, um, in marking, it's not probably a, a marking bias per se. What I'm trying to say is that in schools, especially in Italian school, uh, marking is based 99% on summative assessment and not on formative assessment. And this could account for the mismatch between the results in invalsi tests and the grades provided by schools. And especially, mar I, I refer to mathematics, which is my subject. And especially marking is based on, on, on rot mathematics, especially mechanical, uh, work, many exercises that you have to solve in, in a certain amount of, of time, whereas in Valsi tests are usually more creative kinds of uh, items and the students are not usually uh, prepared to face them. And this could also explain the, the gap between 
more uh, stronger students and weaker students, advantaged students and disadvantaged students. I don't know what you think about this. And thank you very uh, much. Oh, thanks, no, thank you very much, George, for the for the question. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of times the results are stronger when you look at Italian results compared to 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 to, to math. Uh, but I think your point is an important one. And uh, thanks, Gary. In this case, it was not directly my research, although I invite. Uh, Maurice, Gianluca, and the others who did it. So I hope that your point could be taken on board and, and discuss it for further uh, investigation, at least for, for math and how it works. But um, again, one point usually that is, uh, is raised is that uh, the logic within be, be behind uh, an invalsi test uh, is partially different in a lot of cases on how instead uh, normal day-to-day -day tests are taken in school. But I think it's an important point and it deserves, uh, it will deserve attention. On the other hand, what we found um, is, I mean, when you look at other countries where there are, where, I mean, we started using Invalsi thanks to the fact that Invalsi is there just in practically slightly more than a decade, okay? In countries with a longer um, tradition, quite often you can, you might find the same pattern. So there is something there. Uh, but again, I repeat, and this doesn't go to, I mean, it's, it's the request for Patricia and Anna Maria and, and the others from Valsi here. It would be very important if we could try to find a more homogeneous or partially homogeneous test among small, a small set of countries running tests like the Invalsi one, so offset and some other. So we could have a more grounded uh, comparative analysis on these mechanisms. Uh, PISA, OECD PISA is a great thing, but for instance, it could not help us um, in a lot of the micro mechanisms we want to study here. Uh, and, it wouldn't, and it wouldn't help for, for several reasons, but. I mean, how the sample is built uh, and how a sample is shaped is, of course, is not to the universe and so on. But your point is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any, any other question? Uh, Gustavo, if I may give you just very short feedback and then um, <laughs> be quiet. Um, I agree with you. The point is that what we really need to know is to what extent. I mean, uh, I think that the macro mechanisms we are finding here uh, are practically found in any country. The point is we would need to have comparative data, international data, to see the extent. So for instance, the OECD data on homeworks was extremely interesting because the question about does your child, I mean, is your child helped? at home by somebody. Uh, for instance, you had the same question for 70 countries. And Italy after Shanghai was the second, I mean, it was the second highest country in terms of gap between higher educated and lower educated people saying, yes, I support at home my child. It was the opposite of Denmark. I mean, in Denmark, there were a lot of parents saying they help a bit, their, their children at home, but there were no social class differences. In Italy, the group of parents saying, I help at home, my child was more reduced, but it was highly concentrated among middle and upper classes. So what about the United States? Sorry to interrupt because I'm interested in the United States because I worked there for many years. I don't live there now. I'm not like most people who, you know, I, I love the place, but I'm not always, ooh la la, Stati Uniti. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of I was I had a lot of experience in the United States. Some of them very good, some of them very negative. And you know, in the states, you have that differential is extremely high. I mean, you have kids who basically live on the street. And I know for Italians or for anybody outside the United States, they don't want to believe that, but they do. And not just in New York and in Chicago and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have people, parents who you express that, you know, their kids are, they're these super pupils that do everything. They're never home because they're always in some class or some sports team, and then they got to go to music, and then they've got to go to art. Um, so I guess that would, would really interest me. Um, I don't, um, know if you I don't recall, of course, I mean, uh, 
there were many, uh, we've done with this data and other research with two colleagues from the University of Milan, Gabriele Ballarino and, and Matteo Colato. We look at uh, geographical segregation. So how much there is a kind of a student's flight process. Um, so students choosing a school, which is not the closest one to their, to their house and choosing quite often for, for other reasons. You find it never to the extent of the US. So going back to your question, if you look about homeworks, I don't recall the OECD data. Of course, the United States were high, but not as high as Italy, but that's partially because the education system works in a different way. So partially in the US, you would need less if you send your son to a very good private school to be at home helping her or him, okay? So I imagine that there, the social class variable works more for Italy because we are comparing two different education systems where schools deliver differently uh, support to students. Uh, I keep on thinking that the, the US system requires less support from parents at home in terms of teach, I mean, studying or supporting their children with homeworks. When I studied in the US, practically I had no homeworks. I was coming home, I arrived home at 5.30 after practice and seven hours of school and, and dinner was ready at six. So really the system was not based on homeworks, which is totally different for, for, for Italy. Whereas if you look at other micro mechanisms, they are like, as I said, the one about uh, geographical mobility of students. Well, still Italy is not, and I would, should add, although I'm a scientist, I should not. Thanks God, we are not any close to the US. You wouldn't find in Italy phenomena of people of a housing market uh, partially biased by people wanting to buy the house in the right uh, suburb in order to send their kids uh, to the right school, uh, not right school, to the right kindergarten. We, we do not reach, we have not reached that level, but, uh, but it's present. So I would say, as I said, depending on the micro mechanisms, the US would be on the top of the, of the, of the countries in terms of how to create inequalities through some of these micro mechanisms. On others, not, but that depends on the educational design educational system design. What you just said about uh, the parental role is, is very important also maybe a factor explaining why many of the problems Italy has is in terms of the lower secondary school, because that's the level where you start having a lot yes. of work to be done at home. Yes. And, uh, you know, not always, uh, you know, the parents are, are yes. going to do that. And, uh, and you clearly then you have all these uh, you know parental backgrounds coming out as being a yes. role. And if you look also at the dispersion in educational attainment, that arises mainly in at that yeah. level of schooling. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think I mean uh, I know Tito Guerri knows the term. Some of you might, some of you might not. But if you look at welfare state studies, uh, thirty years ago, well, it's more than thirty years ago now, uh, Josta Esping Anderson propose this idea of decommodification of the welfare state. So the idea is how much a welfare state frees people from the risks they, they might incur in terms of income maintenance of the labor market. What I'm trying to think, Tito, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able, is that I would like to create some sort of index of defamilization of education systems. So here there are also teachers in this meeting. What I really like to know is that, is there a way we can measure over time how much implicitly an education system relies on the fact that students, part of what they have to learn, they have to do it by themselves and with their families at home. How much of what is implicitly, of course, if you, if you ask that directly in a public, uh, arena to, to, to teachers or, or to the Ministry of Education, they're going to say, this is an outrageous question. Of course, the school will teach kids all they need. But my impression is that, for instance, in Italy, there is an increasing implicit transfer of education uh, responsibilities out of the school system into private households. And that's where that's where uh, then uh, household uh, cultural and economic resources come into play. 
we do need to know a bit better in a comparative terms how much really we we put on the shoulders of children of, and students. Of course, in a way, it's good. Part of, of learning is you do it by yourself. There is not somebody telling you how to study exactly everything. But uh, part of the lower classes are left behind in a system that is not supportive enough. We have another, the last uh, question yep. by Christina Stringer. Please, Christina. Oh, well, um, I think we, we had very nice ideas from your presentation. And I work at Invalsi um, on, um, on, on, on school improvement, let's say, school self-evaluation and school improvement. And I believe we could add several other factors to, to those that you have already listed affecting the segregation effect and inequalities in schools. And I think that what you are saying uh, is really to, to have a closer look at uh, the need to open up the black box of uh, teaching and learning processes in Italian schools. Is that what you actually want to do? Because this is very interesting for the Institute, I think, I don't know. Christina, thanks. And by the way, we will have to discuss about childcare. <laughs> I hope soon in relation to what we're discussing that that's kind of a, I mean, it's related to the topic. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that Invalsi can play a big role. A lot of what we said so far is based on what Invalsi has been able to produce. But again, being very careful, I think that the fact that Invalsi can have questionnaires um, going along with tests on teachers, on uh, principals, on families, um, can be useful, again, as okay. Tito Bore was saying before, not just to, for accusing somebody or evaluating somebody, but to try to help us to understand more certain mechanisms and support uh, teachers, uh, households, students, and principals to make uh, more uh, effective choices it's a nightmare we have such a high level of drops out. I mean, it's, it's our human capital bleeding and this is the future. Um, so the more we understand also through all these kind of sets of information that Ibalsi can, can help to, 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 to provide and uh, also some insight on the mechanisms, the better for all of us. No, no intention of evaluating or criticizing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Time for a walk. Lucky, lucky them. Patricia Falsetti is making me chair another session after this one. No, 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 va bene, I think somebody should mute or we should stop it here. You decide, Anna Maria. Professor Emanuele Pavolini, thank you, Professor Boeri. I don't see you, but I hope you, you're here. And uh, I, want to, I just uh, would like to stress that in Valsi, make aware um, the ministry, Valeria Fedeli, of the uh, class segregation and also Franco Lorenzoni. There were no teachers uh, stress this point, but uh, in order to avoid uh, class segregation, many person have to stress this fact. Otherwise, uh, just the principal or the teacher are alone in, con in the context that many times um, push this person to organize and to compose class in some way, the, with, with that also with uh, much uh, uh, impulsive and uh, uh, attack to the, the principal. So there is a, a big question and it is a political question that every authority have to stress and uh, uh, to pay attention. Otherwise uh, we can't uh, uh, let alone uh, the school and the school principal, I think. Thank you for all. Thank you to all for the 
an audience and for your uh, speech. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you to the other sessions.